the question. question. And now we go to the next talk of the session. This is uh, a sec half, a second calculus verifier in Isabel Hall. This is the work by Asta Helkier from Fredrik Krogsdal Jakobsen and Jürgen Wildesen. Okay. Can you uh, stop presenting and now? I, I will play the presentation. Okay, presentation will be played. Hello, I'm Frederick Jacobson, and I'm here to talk about SecHav, a sequence calculus verifier in Isabel Hall. This is joint work with Esther Fromm and Jörn Willersen, and we are all from the Technical University of Denmark, DTU. First of all, I'll go through some motivation for why we would want a sequence calculus verifier. Then I'll explain in some details how the system works and what it is, and finally conclude. Classical first order logic is an important topic to learn for many students, especially computer science students, because it can be used to formalize a lot of things. We use a sequence calculus to teach formal deduction and show some results in proof theory. Additionally, we want to show students that computer assistant can help them by providing immediate feedback, which means they don't have to wait for perhaps a few weeks to get feedback on the results. To this end, we introduced the sequence calculus verifier or SECHEF, a simple system that supports students when learning about first order logic. We've used this system in multiple courses at several different levels, uh, though we don't recommend it necessarily as a very first introduction to logic. The syntax of the system is seen here. We have two levels, terms and formulas. Terms can be the functions fun or variables var. Functions are named using natural numbers, which is the n here, and they take some list of terms as the argument. We can, of course, obtain constants by just having an empty list of arguments. Variables are not named, but the n here is instead of the Bruyne index, which I'll come back to later. For formulas, we have predicates, which are also named by natural numbers, and take some list of terms as the argument. If we would like propositional variables, we can simply have an empty list of terms, which then turns the predicate into a constant. We then have uh, the usual logical connectives, implication, disjunction, and conjunction, as well as quantifiers, existential and universal, and negation. The system is a one-sided sequence calculus, which means that there is only a single list of formulas that is the proof state. This list is then disjuncted together, and we use an ordered list and not a multi-set or a usual set because this simplifies our implementation. Here's a very simple example in Isabel Hall in the syntax of the SECAP system. So we start out by writing lemma, which is an Isabel Hall command to basically say that we want to prove something. We then have a double join style, which is essentially a symbol that means that something is provable in the SECAP system. And then we have a list containing only one element, which is the formula we want to prove. Here it's just a disjunction that says, basically, if we have predicate zero and not predicate zero, well, then we can prove that as a, if we disjunct those together. And the way we do so is using one of our proof rules called alpha dis for disjunction to split this disjunction into two, two formulas, which are then in the list. So now we have a list containing predicate zero with some arguments and not predicate zero with the same arguments. And since the list is a disjunction, this is of course uh, provable. And we prove this using the rule basic, which basically says the same argument, uh, which then terminates the proof. Now this can be a little bit a daunting syntax for students if they haven't seen Isabel Hall before, since all of the, the bolded words here are from Isabel Hall. 
So we also have a simpler syntax, which we call the SecHab unshortener syntax, because we also have an unshortener, which can then turn this syntax into the first syntax. And here you can just write uh, the formulas and the proof rules, and a system will then automatically translate this into the other syntax. So this time we just write that we have a disjunction of some predicate P with taking the arguments A and B, and Nick P taking the arguments A and B. We then simply say which proof rules we want to apply and uh, the state of the proof after doing so. So applying alpha dis, which is a proof rule that splits the disjunction, we obtain a list of two formulas, P taking A and B and neck P taking A and B. And we can then again uh, finish the proof using the basic proof rule. The semantics of connectors and quantifiers in this system are defined by just lifting them to the meta logic of Isabel Hall, which makes for a quite simple implementation. And the semantics are defined in terms of simple functions. So the students can easily understand the semantics, even though they might not be very uh, experienced with, form with formal methods or with uh, functional programming. Let's look at the proof rules. We have quite a number of them. Uh, first up, the basic rule, which I mentioned before, and which says that if we have some formula P in our sequent, and we have neck P somewhere else in the sequent, well, then since the sequent uh, is a disjunction, then we have P or not P, which is, of course, provable. So this can terminate a proof branch. We then have the ext rule, which is basically all of the usual structural rules ro rolled into one. So this can do both permutation, uh, weakening, and uh, contraction. We have double uh, negation elimination, neck neck, because this is a classical system. Uh, and then we have uh, the rest of the rules for the connectives are divided into categories uh, using Smolian's annotation. So we have alpha rules, which uh, stay on one proof branch. So this is for disjunction, implication, and negated conjunction, where we can basically turn that into a disjunction on the meta level uh, inside the sequence itself. We also have beta rules, which instead uh, split into two branches. So for example, to prove the conjunction of P and Q, we must prove P and in a separate branch, prove Q. Uh, we can do similar things for negated implication and negated disjunction. Finally, we have gamma and delta rules for quantified formulas. For gamma rules, we have the existential uh, quantifier and the negated universal quantifiers. And here we must substitute um, the quantified variable by some term t, and this can be any term. Uh, and it's important to note here that the substitution is not just syntactically uh, substituting variable zero, because we use the Bruyne indices. So what is variable zero at the beginning, at the outermost level, may not be this, uh, named or referred to by the zero later on when we encounter more quantifiers inside the formula P. So whenever we pass a new quantifier, we have to increase the number that we are substituting uh, for t. And additionally, since we're removing a quantifier, we need to decrease uh, all of the other uh, De Bruyne indices. For delta rules, uh, we, we instead uh, substitute uh, the variable for a constant which is fresh. And fresh in this context basically means that the name does not occur anywhere else in, in, in the sequence. And of course, there is an easy programmatic way to generate a fresh uh, constant, but we would like students to fill it in uh, themselves. Okay, so substitution. This is one of the most complicated things for many students to understand, especially because we're using the Bruyne indices. The reason we're doing this is because we want students to understand the Bruyne indices so they can understand how proof assistants uh, are implemented and how the Bruyne indices work. For this, to this end, we have implemented uh, the substitution using quite basic functions. 
which uh, do not expect a lot of experience with functional programming. So we have some students, for example, who might not know what the map function does, but we still want them to be able to understand uh, what the substitution does. This also helps uh, that splitting this into very basic functions, because then you can call each function separately to understand the, the steps that the, pro, uh, the system performs when doing the substitution. So if a student uh, has an error when they are trying to do some substitution, they can call each of these functions to see where it goes wrong. And we believe this makes it easier for students to learn how the Brain indices work and what kind of things you must uh, think about when, when manipulating formulas that use the Brain indices. Now, uh, we have formalized soundness and completeness of the system in Isabel Hall, and the system itself is also implemented entirely within Isabel Hall, which allows us to prove properties of the calculus directly. Um, for soundness, uh, a simple proof by induction uh, with a, a lemma about substitution is enough. Uh, but for completeness, we base our proofs on existing work in the archive of formal proofs, which is an archive of Isabel Hall proofs and systems that can be used to then prove other things. For example, here, our completeness result. And the proof is basically by relating our calculus to an existing seeking calculus, which uh, there is then a proof of completeness for that calculus in the archive of formal proofs. So this lets students get a little bit of a taste of how you prove soundness and completeness. For soundness, we believe many students will be able to understand all of the proof quite quickly. Uh, for completeness, the story is a little bit more complicated, but at least they can see and, in theory, explore interactively inside Isabel Hall uh, all of the proof. Additionally, and outside Isabel Hall, we have this system called the SECAP Unshortener, which takes the neat, simple syntax I showed earlier and turns it into the Isabel syntax. This is an online system that makes writing proofs easier. And it includes warnings for wrong proofs, but it's not a proof assistance. So proofs must be verified in Isabel Hall to be sure they're actually correct. Uh, it is available at secf.compute.dtudk. Uh, and uh, here's what it looks like. So on the left, we have a shortened proof in the simple syntax, the secf unshortener syntax. And on the right, we have a um, an Isabel Hall proof uh, of the same uh, formula. And this is automatically generated and updates in real time while the student types. So we see on the right here, we have first a, a transliteration of the proof into the usual logic syntax with an arrow instead of the word imp. This is not in the, in the SECAP system, but is encoded directly into uh, the higher order of logic uh, of Isabel. We then have a text which tells the student which uh, numbers the system has picked for each of the names. So here, zero is P. And this is, of course, also for functions if there were any in this formula. And then we have the actual proof. We're using, of course, the mapping uh, between names and numbers that is uh, explained above. As I mentioned, the system can warn students if they do something that's not possible or not a real proof. Uh, so here, the system is saying that the positive formula must be the first in the sequence to apply the basic rule. And we see on the left that this is not the case because the student has this time left out the X application, which allows them to permute the formulas in the sequence to make this happen. Uh, so this proof will not go through if this is copied into Isabel, and the system has warned the student of this. So the system, uh, the SECAP unshortener system is uh, quite usable. Uh, it updates uh, quite quickly, and uh, the students can then write uh, less boilerplate and then simply copy uh, the text on the right into Isabel if they are not familiar with Isabel syntax because we have experienced that some, stu some students uh, can have a very hard, hard time uh, understanding uh, how to write things in Isabel. 
Okay, so in conclusion, the sequence calculus verifier allows students to experiment with formal proofs in a sequence calculus. We believe that students can understand quite easily how the entire system works because everything is implemented with simple functions that do not re require very much experience with functional programming. And the students can also give a taste of proofs of soundness and completeness using the system uh, because they can interactively explore these proofs inside the Isabel Hall uh, interactive session. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can clap hands virtually. And now it's time for questions. We have uh, something like 10 minutes for questions. So I can see there is a question from uh, from Carlos, uh, and he, he asks uh, why use the Brain indices, and would it be easier to to not? And yes, it it would be easier to not use the Brain indices, but really we want students to learn how to use the Brain indices. So this is the reason we are sort of forcing this on them. Um, and of course, like if you are doing it uh, by hand, you will probably not. Uh, use the brain indices, but here we are kind of focused on how you can implement also um, systems. So we, we want be, uh, this, our students to be able to sort of uh, understand, and we think this is uh, a, a nice way to show them and to be able to, as I mentioned also uh, before, uh, to be able to interactively explore with a simple implementation uh, how each step in sort of using the brain indices works. Uh, and then he also asks, is it easier to use a, a one-sided system? And um, here again, I guess there are different opinions. You can say, okay, well, uh, maybe it's easier to have maybe assumptions and, the, uh, and then conclusions as in a, a two-sided system. Uh, but here we don't really so much, I would say, care about you know, having the uh, lemmas or theorems and then proving something from them, which is also why we don't have a cut rule, which it also perhaps is an obvious question. Uh, so here we just really want to have students prove single formulas. This is, uh, um, I mean, uh, in some sense, introductory uh, system. So we want students to be able to understand sort of what is happening exactly when we want to prove just a single formula. And then later on, we can move to, you know, a full Isabel Hall uh, uh, logic, and then we can get to some more advanced and more complicated things. But we would like really for students to completely understand what is happening uh, at the basic level. So I hope, Carlos, that is enough uh, answer. But otherwise, uh, please write again. And if there are any other questions, uh, please. Uh, so Giselle asks if we use Isabel later on in the course, and the answer is yes. Uh, we actually use this in two different courses, uh, one uh, bachelor level and one master level. Uh, and in both of them, we, we use Isabel, uh, mostly in the master level course. Uh, and we, we use Isabel Pure, Isabel Hall uh, to explain various concepts. And we also have some other systems that are also uh, to a degree implemented in Isabel. Uh, so yes, we, we use this as sort of, uh, as I mentioned, a stepping stone, because Isabel is very complicated if you're just thrown into it. So we want to first let students understand for a very simple system like this, how can you, how, how exactly does everything work? And then we can move uh, over to, to Isabel Hall, which is much more complicated uh, later on. I hope that that was enough uh, of an answer. Uh, so, so, yeah. So any other, any other questions? And otherwise, I can maybe say that kind of the point of this is we we experience that that it's difficult for students to just get thrown into Isabel. So we want to have this this stepping stone and and be let students sort of have something where it's pretty easy to understand everything that's going on. And this is also why we implement this using uh, very simple functions, so students can experiment with like each step of a verification to see how it works. I have one more question. Uh, yes, please. You mentioned that you do a completeness proof yes. for the logic. And 
as far as I understand what you told during the talk, this is a proof by a reduction to some other proof system. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so now uh, uh, the question is, would it be possible to uh, give some kind of feeling how a traditional Hankin style completeness proof could look like within Isabel using this kind of uh, well, framework as you do? Yes, uh, and actually the, the, we reduced to a proof that is then sort of a traditional proof. And since it's implemented in, in Isabel, uh, students can, you know, our completeness theorem is basically just, this system is complete, so then ours is also by reduction. Um, but they can also explore the, the other proof or the, the, the proof that we reduce to um, okay. uh, interactively within Isabel. And that is kind of a, a, a traditional. Uh, okay. But, but for, for our purposes, and especially on the bachelor, bachelor level course, uh, uh, throwing students into a, a full uh, completeness proof is a bit much and, and many will not really understand <laughs> it. Uh, so, so we try to say, okay, well, uh, we just want to essentially like show them here is sort of the idea and then later on they can maybe understand. And I can see my co-author Esther has linked the, the development in, um, in the archive of formal proofs where you can, where, where, which of course students can also access if they are interested. Uh, so yes, and, and I can mention also that we, we have some uh, some ongoing work of on a, on a more uh, direct completeness proof, where we essentially create a, a, an automated theorem prover for this system, and then uh, and then prove that complete directly to to show completeness. Uh, but this is not uh, finished. So <laughs> okay. So any other questions? Okay. Uh, it it seems not. Uh, yeah, there are links from uh, your colleague. Yes. So so these are the links to the um, to the the other system that is that we base our completeness proof on, mm -hmm. and this is in the archive of formal proof. So it's sort of a, uh, you can say a, a proof library, a, the a library of theorems uh, for Isabel. Um, that can then be used by anyone, uh, including us, of course. Any more questions? I can't hear, I think. So no, let's no. thank the speaker or the, the, the group again for the, for the very nice talk. And, and thank you for the, for the nice questions as well. And we can finish our session.